Hey everybody, welcome to Leon's Chainsaw Parts and Repair. Happy Friday. Made it through yet another work week, thank goodness. Alright, we have not done a Mac video for a while. So, let's dive in. We have Charles Little McCulloch. I am struggling to remember exactly which model this is. It's one of the Mini Mac styles. I want to say it's a 110, but we'll find out. It's been disassembled, and there is a bunch of the hardware, it's been cleaned, well it has been disassembled, okay, there's our engine, let's keep digging here. Interesting. Something in this box looks like it might have come from the chainsaw. I'm sure most of you guys have found him on the web if you're looking for used parts. Great source. You never quite know what you're going to find and when you're going to find it. Ah, there's a problem. Damn. And there's the solution. Better. This barb right here is all jacked up. But here is a replacement hose and barb assembly. So at some point, we'll get all that out of there. One problem on these old Mac saws, the fuel tank seam could start to leak. And if that happens, of course, you get a puddle of gas under it the minute you uh, start filling it up. Uh, I have had good luck scuffing these. A little layer of JB Weld on there. It's usually right along this seam right here that it does it. We'll see. I don't see where this one showing any indication of that, but I say we got to get this thing all unpacked. All right, there's the old style metal starter pulley. Got the customary crack in that plastic collar right there, but the the steel is still tight to the drum, so we should be good. Oh boy, all kinds of good jazz. There's our clutch. All right, this is an earlier saw than I was thinking. This old style sprocket. Clutch with the nut still in there. You might have a Mini Mac 35 here. And the reveal, Mini Mac 35. You'd think I'd remember all that kind of stuff, but sometimes I don't. And by golly, it is pretty clean. Truth in advertising there. Coil, condense, wow. There was some serious disassembly done on this saw. Let's start corralling hardware. So we are going to need it. There's the crankshaft key. Oh, geez. We even got the throttle trigger off. Okay, there's some of that stuff. All right. Well, you guys have talked about wanting a start to finish, and we may just get there on this one. New air filter, coil screw, right, let's make sure we get all this crap out, because we're going to need it. A 30 second starter screw, yeah, we'll see about that, those are aftermarket. We'll just see. All right, we're to the bottom of the tank. So we got all this good stuff in front of us. Let's take a look inside the engine. There we go, she rolls over nice. Always have the problem of this focusing. Hopefully, there and somewhere in there is a good view of the piston rings. This looks good. This engine looks good and tight. Points don't look all jacked up. First step, though, with the way this all goes together, you guys have all seen these assembled. I'm assuming. 
yeah, there is a process. We gotta get the old carburetor ready to rock and roll before we can stack the coil onto it next. And hopefully those coil insulators are in here somewhere. That is one part that I am not seeing. So we may end up having to do a multiple stages on this video, but let's see where we can get. This is the Walbro MDC. It's an MDC 9 carburetor. I think these are the only saws that this particular guy was used on. So, but there were a lot of these made. I've had mixed luck personally rebuilding these carbs. Uh, something about them is just kind of a challenge, I guess we'll call it. But let's pop it apart here and see what's cooking. That is one, one challenge when you get a saw in that you have no history on. And it's completely disassembled like this. You gotta kind of piece together, well, why did it come apart? What's the real real issue? Okay, that diaphragm is still pliable. So what I like to do is to carefully, especially on these inlet diaphragms, if possible, not tearing it, get it loose from that main gasket and we'll get a new set on it. Because they tend to kind of form a shape, we just get a little bit inflexible. Alright. This is always a touchy one, but... As I try to move this, I'm not seeing that, that needle move a hell of a lot here. So I'm going to give just a little bend. All right, now I can see it moving. We're going to have to pressure test this thing when we get it back together. Just to make sure she's not leaking. This insulator block is plastic, so you want to be careful with it. I just want to check these two flappers. Carefully. Okay, that side's a little bit stiff, and I'm going to guess that's the inlet now. That's interesting. And that's not a good idea. Dropping carburetor screws is a terrible idea. I'm wondering if I have any MDC carb kits in my collection of junk around here. I don't work on these Macs a hell of a lot anymore. Just not that much call for it. Strike one. I hate to think what I just dropped there. damned. Ha! Pays to have a junk pile sometimes. Here we have a nice OEM D1 MDC. So we'll just put this whole kit in here and then we'll start fresh. Four gaskets. I love that simplicity. not lining up for beans, so I got a bass backwards. There we go. Now I do see a little residue of the old uh, gasket on here, so we want to make sure to get all that crap cleaned off. And make sure it doesn't stay in the carburetor.
Come on, dummy. this insulator block to get everything aligned and in place here. See screw holes there finally. One thing I can assure you is I don't work on these nearly as much as the home lights, and therefore I'm not nearly as quick with them. But my first saw growing up, and it must have been 10 or 11, my dad had a Mini Mac 35 that he had bought before I was born and was thoroughly unimpressed with it and wanted, I think the, the bar bolt had broken and so he put it on the shelf and said I'm done with this thing and went and bought himself a home light Super 2 and he never looked back. He was much happier with the Super 2 than he ever was with the Mini Mac. But it was just a saw sitting there and by then my mechanical uh, interest was starting, so he let me get the damn thing down, and we were able to, and I got it apart, got a new bar bolt, new sprocket, a few other little jazz things on it, and got it running. So I just put a little 10-inch bar on it initially, and uh, that was a great, great saw to learn on. And he was right. There's nothing wrong with a 35, or that series of saw, but I do personally believe the Super 2 is a superior saw. Less prone to flooding and a little more torque. These things I think rev a little higher, at least it always felt like that, but didn't quite have the torque of a reed valve engine. These are piston ported wide open there, so. All right, I am comfortable that the carburetor is good on this thing but we're at a stopping point for at least a few minutes or a few days depending on whether I can find any of those plastic insulators if I didn't see them anywhere in one of these baggies I don't see them floating loose in the box here the reason those are important is they insulate they take up some slack here on the carb and then they insulate the coil from the carburetor and the grounding screw here. They do need to be there. Just don't see them. So let me go back to the box of junk here. Well, that's unfortunate. I would have liked to have been able to test fire this thing on video today, because it won't take a whole lot more to get it put together, but we're not going ahead without the insulators, so go to the old standby and we'll hit up eBay and see, uh, see what we can find and we'll come back. Well, once in a while, we look out. I have forgotten in my last batch of McCulloch parts that I got in, I had some of these new old stock insulators. So, we'll just keep this party going. So we're going to start one. Get that gasket surface cleaned up first. These gaskets have gotten pretty hard to find too. 
So if there's any way to salvage your old one, I recommend it. And obviously the most important part is the part sealing the carburetor to the insulator. If it chips a little bit way out over here on that edge, it's not as big of an issue. Nobody wants to pay 20 bucks for a damn NOS gasket if they don't have to. So it'll go easy as you're pulling this apart. So we're going to put an insulator in and slip the gasket on. And that'll kind of help hold things in place. That surface looks good. Okay. Once the carburetor is there, let's carefully work another. Start with the gasket, get it. There it goes. You'll feel it drop. You have to force these things. There's probably something being done wrong. You don't want to blast those ends out and get them out of shape, or they're just a complete pain in the ass from there on out. Make sure you don't lose the little baby flat washers that are supposed to be on those screws. They are important. We'll get the carb snug in place here. It doesn't need to be mega tight. And the coil sits over the top of those next two insulators and there's a ground strap on the wire right here. We've got to make sure to get that in place. Slip that right over top. You'll feel it drop and see it drop into place over those little plastic insulators. And then we'll get this kind of snug too, but still movable. We need to set our clearance to the flywheel, but we're not quite ready to do that yet. We need to get the points cover on. Actually, I'm going to roll that over and make sure that it's opening the points to the right distance. These things aren't super finicky about that. I mean, the spec usually on these calls for about a .015 opening, as long as you're in the ballpark. Usually they fire just fine. You want to be as accurate as possible, but... Alright, I see... Looks like this spark plug wire has been repaired previously. Now, it looks like it was repaired well. I don't see where that's going to leak anything. So we'll run with it. But we're going to test this thing for spark before we get the damn thing all together. I'm not going to play that game. So let's roll it over. Okay. I'll show you where this is at. And I don't consider it enough. I'm going to open this gap up just a smidge. Again, I'm looking at the screen. And I don't know if you guys can see that or not, but this looks like about a, a point of 7, about half of what it should be. So you just got to loosen the base up. And widen it out. You want to make sure you're on the top of the lobe highest point, which I definitely am right there. And then another thing that can happen is that the base can move as you're tightening it up. It's not abnormal at all, I'm afraid. So I want to make sure that you end up with the setting you wanted. Alright, that, that is much better. Almost there. So close. And yes, somewhere someone's going to say, ah, oh, you should just get your feeler gauge out and do it. Yeah, probably. But I've said enough of these, and I know what I'm doing. There we go. That's it. So let's get this nut off of here. We'll get the cover on. We'll check our clearance of coil to flywheel. The good thing with these little mini Macs is even when you tear them down like this, there's just not that many parts. And this one was torn down probably a little bit further than it needed to be. 
and I'll show you some of that here in a few minutes. All right. so long since I've had one of these apart. I think this cover just snaps into place. Yeah, there we go. Alright. I think that other tab is over in that box. But we'll worry about that when we get there. Flywheel key. I'm actually surprised that came out. A lot of times these things are tough to get to move. Once they're in there, they're pretty much in there. Let's see if that's seated well enough to get this thing started. There she goes. Nice thing, McCulloch used a washer nut on these. So it's not terribly, you don't have to fight with a, a lock washer and all that other jazz. Tighten one down and go. Come on, where the hell? Is that other adapter? It's amazing how stuff can disappear on a workbench that you know you had just seen. And it's half the time right in front of your face. This one's fighting me pretty good. I do not see that socket adapter. There it is. I said right in front of my face. Okay. No need to get out of control. So now we're going to set that gap. And this I will use the feeder gauge on. You can use a business card to get you right at the same thickness. I don't have a business card out here. Get this coil pried back. Yeah. Don't fight with me, do you? Not a whole lot of adjustment on these, to be perfectly honest. At least not most of the time. So what I like to do is get my gauge right between the legs of the coil and the flywheel and then roll it over to the magnets. And you can just put some pressure with your thumb there and that gets you tight to the flywheel. You don't want to get carried away with these screws. You want them tight, but not to where you snap something off and break it. I'm pretty sure fishing a broken screw out of this cylinder wouldn't be any fun at all. Okay, there we are. Like I said, we're going to check this thing for spark. And this even has the correct spark plug. That I'm happy to see. These McCulloch use a hotter plug than the Homelies. This is the DJ8J, which I believe is correct. And this looks almost brand new. Oh, I had a... Oh, shoot, I didn't notice that. That was stupid. First mistake. The condenser... is not hooked up. Alright, so we've talked about magnets on flywheels and how they can be demagnetized if you're not careful. Some of these flywheels, if you don't have a, a jaw puller, which I do, you have to do what I just did to get it off. Now I knew this one wasn't going to be that tight, and using a plastic dead blow with taps like that, you're not going to damage a magnet. 
but if you take a full on steel hammer and start whaling on it, that's where you're going to run into some serious issues real quick. Come on, baby. Don't want you broken. Well, that was interesting. That was interesting. Come off of there. At least get back out of the way. So what I failed to notice is that's the connection to the points right there. Without that, we don't go very far. Not very far at all. Now, I'm not going to be surprised if we run into another challenge here. In terms of having spark, these old condensers are kind of known for being a pain in the ass. That's why they're getting so hard to find. A lot of guys have had to replace them. If we get to that point, I may talk to Charles about a uh, electronic ignition conversion. The point systems are reliable enough, they are good, but sometimes the new old stock condensers, when you find them, the damn things are 25 bucks or more for a condenser. And for me, that's a little hard to swallow. I'm not a not a big fan of that action. Okay, I probably have that face in the wrong direction. You gotta be careful as you mount these condensers that you've got your wires away from the flywheel so that they don't rub and end up shorting out. And I'm not sure that I'm certain that I didn't get this one in quite the right spot. This is a part you normally shouldn't have to take loose unless you're going to split the crankcase to do a reseal or something like that. Then you'll be taking it loose. Alright, what is the, there we go. You can use the, if you're reusing parts, you can use the bends, the forms, and the old wires to kind of give you an idea of how the hell it's supposed to sit in there. And then you can adjust your, your screws from there. some good vibrations. Could short those damn wires right out to that condenser. And that's a great way to lose spark. So we're going to try to avoid that. these aren't aren't terrible to work on once you've taken it out of the case once you're just no it's enough to piss you off if you, if you have to do it again and as we're witnessing there are things that can be not so much fun on these Flywheel back on. Really like to test the spark on this and see where we're at. Don't for, 
excuse me, don't force your flywheel. It should drop pretty easily. All right. At this point, we should be safe to roll this over and see if we have spark. And we don't. So, now, it's time for the Easter egg hunt. Uh, is there a bad wire? Is it a bad condenser? I know the points aren't bad. Those were nice and clean, but that's going to be why this thing was taken apart. It's going to be a lack of spark. Alright, I'm going to end the video here for now. I'm going to come back once I have Spark and tell you guys how we got there because this may be a, a bit of a process. In fact, I'll probably just go ahead and post this as part one of the video. Uh, so I'll have to go kind of process of elimination, find a, a condenser that I know is good, but this may take a, a few weeks actually of ordering parts and stuff like that to figure out what is going on. If I've got a electronic ignition module up here I might just go ahead and wire it in and that way I can test to make sure the coil itself isn't the issue because just doing parts replacements is no fun especially when you're the, you know, the owner who has to to pay for whatever it ends up being so I'm going to try and do this the smart way. Like I say we'll report back as soon as possible. Okay everybody uh, so it's been several weeks since the this video was started. Uh, ended up diagnosing that the original condenser was the culprit. That's what's gone bad. No outward sign. It's not swollen. Just bad. I don't know why, but I have found these particular saws. That condenser ha is extraordinarily unreliable. Wow. Okay. If you've got an ignition problem, that's likely what it's going to be. Uh, the coils, yeah, sure, they go bad once in a while, but uh, typically not very often. Well, I'll just give you a quick demonstration. We have great spark now. So, we are ready to continue with the assembly here. So hopefully we've got all the stuff we need here. I've still got my parts bin pulled, just in case. Uh, the only other thing I've done since diagnosing that condenser as bad was get the trigger and spring back into this thing. And there's no magic to that. You just have to get the spring looped down around the tang and through the trigger. And you will fail a couple times and it's just a pain in the neck. You actually don't need to take this loose unless the trigger is broken. You can get the whole case apart without it. Quick note, as you're getting ready to set this thing into the case, you want to get your spark plug the heck out of the way, of course. And you want the fuel hose routed like this, underneath or I guess above the spark plug. So as it sits in the engine, you want your fuel hose routed so the spark plug wire comes up and around it. Because you've got to get this indexed down into the engine case. So I'm going to actually turn this barb so that it basically faces downward. That's where you want it to be. You do want to get your throttle rod onto the carburetor first. And what I like to do is turn the engine over until the flywheel magnet is right there and then it'll hold that rod in place as you're slipping it in. Get your choke out of the way because you cannot assemble these with the choke knob in place. And in some cases certain uh, fast idle screws and idle speed screws, if they stick up too far, you got to get them out as well. But uh, that kind of barrel type that uh, you pull the trigger and press down, that one has to come out. This is just a single idle screw. It'll be fine. So 
So then, you're just going to work it into the case. And the first thing you want to do is get your spark plug wire to actually come through where it belongs. At least get the boot through. Because if you do that, the rest will kind of fall into place. You're going to flip it up. And you're going to try and guide it in. And guide the fuel hose into the channel that's in the engine housing for it. And what you want to do is get that nylon tank bushing to slip in and come out right at the bottom there. You get it there and you are set. Now I've got something hanging up here. That engine housing hasn't gone in, or engine hasn't gone all the way into the housing yet. So we'll figure out what it is. is out of whack here. Ah, there's my spark plug wire bunching up there. So you're going to get it into place and you're going to know you're pretty damn close when you start seeing all your carburetor screws lined up. Carburetor centered right here in the air filter opening. And the hose is still in its channel and I can see that it the barb, the fuel connector is still in its spot here. So, as you guys know from the early part of this video, I got the saw completely disassembled. But, I've done enough of these that I think I can pick out the three engine screws here. Here we go. Uh, I grew up with a Mini Mac 35. I probably mentioned that in the earlier part of the video. These do rattle. And they will vibrate some screws loose. So we're going to use a little bit of Loctite blue on these bad boys. Just to make sure that everything stays in the engine housing the way it should. Now the reason that that throttle trigger was removed was probably to get better access to this screw. You technically don't even need to take the throttle handle itself off if you're really good about this. But accessing, as you can see, this top screw, it's a little tight, especially if the throttle handle is here. But you want to start it by hand. If the throttle handle still whoops, still in place, you're going to end up doing this whole thing probably by hand and then tightening it down with a box end wrench. Alright, that's still a little bit loose, which is exactly what I want. Your next one is right down here. And the last one is at the bottom. Before you get any further, you got to get your throttle rod reconnected. Remember we've got the flywheel over here, the magnets are holding it in place. What you're going to end up doing is pulling your throttle trigger up, grabbing that with a pair of needle nose pliers and setting it into the throttle trigger. The trigger has a, a slot up here. And the, basically the spring action of the plastic is what holds that in place. You're going to snap it down in there. There's no way I can show you guys that. I would like to know what that's all about. Is 
Damn, Kate. How? Are you serious? Actually, I'm not sure what the hell that's hitting. You gotta be kidding me. This is funny, folks. This is real funny. In order to avoid losing them, it looks like the starter screws were put back in here. Much better. Stupid. Jeez. Anyway, back to our throttle. You're going to rotate your magnet away so that it's not fighting you. You'll grab that throttle rod, slip it up and over, and then when it's basically in place, flat blade screwdriver is your friend. You're just going to push it kind of downward and you'll see it clip into place. And there you go. All right. Well, we solved the starter catastrophe, my goodness. Okay, so we're going to start finding out what's missing here. I see one of the starter retainer rings. Well, not rings, washers. These are a, uh, look like just a piece of sheet metal. that goes over the starter to hold it in place. One of those is missing. Well, we'll see if the happy bag of junk here has anything. Well, it's not black. Like all the other ones are. But at least it's the right part. The hell is the starter? There we go. So, I guess this is a good time. We'll make sure the, that spring feels, feels good. I don't necessarily like the looks of that. It looks like it's been repaired. And it's down here in its groove, but not as well as I'd like to see it. Looks like this hook was rebent at some point. Okay. As long as she'll clear the, the air filter cover. Okay. Yeah, it pulls into place. pretension, except it would help to get the rest of these screws out of the way. These have been replaced, but at least they appear to be the right thread. I don't know when McCulloch went metric, but it was a whole lot earlier than Holmlight did, so you want to be real careful mixing and matching fasteners on these things. Pretension there, we'll throw that up through. And she drops right in. Now, if I don't retie this right now, I have a mess on our hands. And since I don't like doing stuff twice that you can do once, we'll just do it this way and do it right. Okay. There we go. These pulleys don't hold a hell of a lot of rope. I guess we could put a, another wrap on that. Well, this video is just going to get longer and longer. But this is a good, good, good idea for guys. If you get one that's been partially disassembled or that you don't know much about, you're going to end up going through it quite a bit. 
and there will be some trial and error. This actually has bigger rope on it than it needs. Yeah, it's pretty short. Jeez. We'll use a nice number four here. I'm going to add a good, a good 16 inches. We may end up having to trim some of that off. It may not fit, but that's okay. You want to burn your rope ends just a little bit. Just enough to keep it from fraying. Tie a knot in one end, and then we'll fish that through. Wind it up. I'm ready to hear this saw test run. I don't know about you guys. Alright, so McCulloch put these holes to go all the way through the rope drum here, so you need to use your, your pick tool to snag that rope not do that, hopefully. Good lord. Pull the whole strand. Alright, chill out kids. I'm making a video. Can I say hi? Yeah, say hi real quick. Hi everyone! I have right. a really huge fella I got from Home Goods. Alright, in the house. Never let it be said that she's uh, not a ham. Okay. There we go. We could have wound the spring and tensioned it to wind the rope up, but I'm just going to do it this way and just let the pulley slip the spring a little bit. Won't hurt anything. Find your notch. I'm going to give it two wraps. That was actually about one and a half, but that's okay. Same thing we did before. Push it through, drop it into place, and we'll tie it off. Okay, much better. So again, with this, there's a number of starters that were used on these. This style does require that you use these flat washers to retain it. Take it. Hi. Take it in the house so it doesn't get dirty. It's in my okay. Looks like mom might have spoiled them again. That's okay. They're good kids. Now, these screws. I'm going to bet are still a little bit too long. I'm going to check this clearance flywheel. Okay, thank you, Katie. I'm making a video. Yeah, see that. That might actually be one of the problems as to why this saw is apart. These, uh, the clearance here, the housing to flywheel is very minimal, and these screws are a good sixteenth of to an eighth of an inch too long, so they are going to have to be shortened up. So I will do that in a few minutes. We'll finish the assembly here, and then I'll shut the video off, trim the screws, and we'll do come back for a test run after that. Guys, so Caitlin, please, I'm making a video. Stop. So as you recall, this old tank has a busted fuel barb in it. We need to get that out of the way. And that is easy enough to do. And a pair of pliers. This does have an O-ring on it, so it's gonna be gonna be on there a little bit. Oh, where the hell my channel locks? Or even this will work. I'm going to be careful not to crack the tank. 
So on these things, the fuel filter is way down here. And it's just this rectangular piece of felt that's well, about that long. And that's how you install it, is from right there. You shove it in there. So it's really important that you have that, that barb in place down here. And what you're going to do is make sure that your oil hose is pointed straight forward and start to index this in. And you should feel you should feel it indexing on the fuel bar, and you should be able to see the hose going into the tank. And then you're going to go and snap it in. So there you go. this point, we're just going to keep going and get this front end buttoned up. The manual oiler on these saws is not very complex. It's retained in the tank up here and it's actuated with this little, uh, little rod. It's set up so that you can use your left thumb as you're holding on here to do the manual oiler if you need to. The automatic oiler is adjustable. That's what that screw is. So generally, I haven't found the need to go manual a whole lot. Not to say that you won't, but I haven't found the need. And that screw definitely didn't belong up there. Alright, so this cover is pretty damn self-explanatory. Slide it on. Make sure that lever's not pinched. Now these old tanks had felt that was supposed to go underneath. I mean, it it comes apart once and it, you're done. It bunches up in here. I mean, you might be... I've been able to reinstall them, but I typically don't worry about it a whole lot. I just try not to overfill them. That's really all that felt is there for is to catch any spillage. So if everything is lined up... should go right on. Done. Starting to look like a saw. So, your front handle and your throttle handle are going to mount up top with the same screw. Now this is plastic and it's very easy to over tighten one of these. You don't want to do that. You can see that the plastic, even when you're careful, starts to crack out there at the tip. If you over tighten this too much, it'll just blow this handle apart. Not really what you want to do. So set that into place. Fish your, uh, let's see, how is it that? Your spark plug wire through. So the handle will just sit up onto its mount, and once it lines up, you can put this self-tapper in. And like everything else, you want to start this by hand and try and reuse the old threads. That is enough. Ah, we'll put a little Loctite on the bottom screw, just for good measures. say I've already checked these to make sure nothing is stripped out but that is something you want to do before you get too far into assembly make sure you don't need to put any helicoils anywhere because finding out about it when the engines already half or two-thirds assembled is not what you want to know all right that's funny I'm I'm wondering if that's why this was torn apart at first Alright, here on the back, at the throttle handle, where's the other screw? Where is the other screw? Great. Well, there's always going to be one that's missing. We know that.
pull, but you're not the right. That'll work. That one. That one matches even better. All right, we'll use that. You have a little steel insert and then a washer plate and then your screw. If you just try and run a screw in here, you're going to run it right through that plastic. So what you want to do is drop your insert in, set your steel washer up here, make sure that you'll start by hand and then repeat for the other side. kind of like a saw. This rubber seal is for your air filter. You want to clean all the garbage off of that. It fits over the carburetor neck here. Best way I found to install that is a small flat blade screwdriver. One of those dental picks would work too. But you're just going to work it around that neck of the carburetor. And you'll know when it drops into place. It'll look about like that. This is a new air filter that was included. And this thing, you can actually see daylight through this old one. So it's going to go where it belongs. And we'll put this, this is an aftermarket. And in shipping, it appears to have been crushed. Not the best thing. Actually, that's deformed quite nicely. Get it so that it fits. There we go. You need it to fit down over that seal. On these Mini Max, this air filter cover has this little clip that's basically a spring loaded deal. The later 110s and stuff had a screw right here. You just want to index it under the starter and then. It should snap into place back here. Line that clip up. There you are. Choke's got to be put on, choke knob. Uh, this is, this uh, knob has a relief in it so that it will only fit the right way. So you want to carefully set it on and it'll drop down. Tighten it up. Should be impossible to put on the wrong way, but not if you force it. it doesn't take force. All right. Again, the earlier Mini Max. This is the style sprocket they used. This one is a not worn out, amazingly. So I'm going to put it back on bearing is pressed into there. Again on these early ones the nut is actually molded into the clutch spider itself. So all you gotta do is thread it on. This one doesn't have a chain break, otherwise that would be part of this housing. Bar adjusters housed in there. So this is ready to test fire other than the muffler and those screws that need to be trimmed off. And we're going to hope those muffler screws are inside here. 
And we're lucky that they are. All right, these don't have too much grease and oil and crap on them. If they did, we'd stop and clean them up. Those are going to get some Loctite as well. I lost count as a kid how many times I stopped to pick the muffler up from my, my 35. Growing up on the coast, it wasn't such a big deal. It wasn't a, wasn't a huge danger that I was going to light a fire by having that damn muffler come off. But at the same time, they still get pretty hot. Plus, trying to search for it in foot tall grass is not fun. Alright, I'm going to use, so that I don't bung all that Loctite off, I'll use some needle nose pliers to drop these in place. And they pretty much want to go in the right spot. is not, to my knowledge, a spark arrestor screen for these. I'm trying to remember. No, I take that back. There is. There is a wire mesh screen. I remember what it is now. I tried to find one I guess, ah, when I was a kid. And a saw show up across the street told me that this was a spark arresting muffler. And I believed him at that time. But I've since found out that's not the case. There is a screen that can go in here. The louvers aren't very wide on that muffler cover, but they're still wide enough. Sparks will come out. I don't know about the eastern states. I know here on the west, I think every state, I want to say every state west of the Rockies requires a uh, spark arrestor screen on any public or private lands. And that may be true across the United States now. I, I honestly don't know. Alright. There we are. Mini Mac assembled. So, even though they look terrible, when you see the pile of parts, or if you're first taking one apart, it can look kind of daunting, but it's not so bad. Actually, this spark plug is one of the worst things to fish in there. You kind of really do need the, the little McCulloch thin wall tool to get it in there with the least amount of trouble. My spark plug socket just drops. Again, this is another one of those you want to get it started by finger before you get carried away with a ratchet so that you don't end up stripping out the threads on the cylinder. It's bad news. Okay, I'm going to kill the video, take care of shortening those screws a little bit, uh, and then we'll come back for a test run. Okay, screws have been shortened. We're going to find out this thing wants to run. Carburetor kit should have taken care of it. Now one note, when you first fill it, you should look for any fresh gas. If you find it, it means your fuel tank's not indexed properly or there's a problem with that O-ring. And you better stop and deal with it right now. Same thing with the oiler. If you put a little oil in this tank, and you end up with a puddle of oil underneath your saw when it's not running, more than likely that hose is either bad or you just don't have it indexed into the tank properly. And we're looking okay so far. Alright, well, I have no idea if the tuning's any good on this, where it was set before. But let's see what it'll do.
Well, it's close, but it would appear, and this is very unfortunate, but it would appear that for whatever reason, it's leaking fuel past the, it is, son of a bitch. That is leaking fuel past the uh, inlet needle and flooding out. And that's very, very unfortunate because it means all of that stuff we just had, we just put together. I'm going to take it all back apart again. But hell, at least we know the oiler's working good. So, anyway. There's another assembly video on a Mini Mac. This one from pretty much all the way torn apart to not. Again, there's steps I'm going to skip to get back to that carburetor. The clutch is not coming off. The muffler's not coming off. Throttle handle and all that's not coming off. Starter. Fuel tank cover. Fuel tank choke. Air filter seal. Spark plug. That'll slide that engine out. So, in reality, it's about 10 minutes worth of work. It's the principle of the thing. So, anyway, we'll come back for a test run. Uh, I'll just do that on a completely different video when I get this thing running right. It's not a new video. I couldn't let this one go. I don't know what was in there that was blocking that needle. If anything, I mean, I think there was just a little piece of dirt or something. Uh, I also adjusted the uh, inlet lever spring up just a smidge. So, has a little more pressure, or it t will take a little more uh, pulse in the engine to move it, but I pumped her up to. 12 on the carburetor gauge and it held nice and good and I don't see uh, the telltale wisp of evaporated fuel coming out of here so I'm going to call this one good give it my standard treatment of let it sit for a couple days, restart it and if it starts without any trouble it's going to go home <laughs>